So hear now this reading from the prophet Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lofty, and the hem of God's robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of God's glory. The pivots of the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, Having, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. For the word of God in Scripture for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. What is holy? What is sacred? What do those words mean to you? <clears throat> Last autumn, I was in a conversation with the Reverend Frank Rivas of First Unitarian Church and Rabbi Josh Brown of Temple Israel, and we were discussing the idea of hosting a series of interfaith dialogues. Now, we are still having that conversation because we have been unable to find a single day in this entire spring that the three congregations' calendars align, but we're working on it. <clears throat> During the planning last fall, Frank raised the question, when we call each life holy, what do we mean by that? So as I pondered that question, I realized that holiness is not something that I've ever really preached about. It's a word that appears in our hymns and our liturgies, but we don't talk a lot in our tradition about holiness. When the staff gathered to plan worship for Lent, I mentioned Frank's question and asked if they thought we could build a, the season of Lent around exploring holiness. As we discussed the topic, we quickly admitted that the concept is often associated with negative things like purity and pietism, exclusion and self-righteousness. It has this overly moralistic quality at times. You know, you think of the person who is holier than thou. But we also use the term to describe good things. There is holy ground, the places that are special to us, it was this idea which has inspired our sanctuary decorating team to use these cairns to, as a visual representation of the Lenten theme. Cairns are trail markers and landmarks used around the globe in multiple cultures. They can have simple meanings, marking the path through a barren landscape, or rich symbolic meanings. In recent years, I've encountered them most often on rocky beaches where tourists build their own, memorializing their presence in some particularly beautiful spot. We also use the idea of holiness to describe all life as sacred. This sacramental theology teaches that the grace of God is poured out in all things and that in all things we can experience God. So we soon realized that there was plenty of material to occupy us for the season of Lent. Lent is the season that precedes Easter. It's usually a time of self-examination and personal growth, often through repentance or practicing spiritual disciplines. And exploring the holy and what it means to be holy seemed appropriate then for Lent. And I'm always thankful Joyce Wilson put my water up here for me, so today in particular. And so we begin <clears throat> with the holiness of God. And this magisterial passage found in Isaiah 6, where the prophet has his vision of the throne room of God and the attending seraphim 
hovering about with their six wings, singing this hymn, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with God's glory. In describing this vision, the great scholar of the prophets, Walter Brueggemann, writes, We are here at the core of holiness, from which is decreed all that happens everywhere in creation. Rudolf Alto, in his book, The Idea of the Holy, wrote, If a man does not feel what the numinous is when he reads the sixth chapter of Isaiah, then no preaching, singing, telling can avail him. This passage, then, is the starting point for understanding holiness within our biblical tradition. So what's happening here? My professor on the prophets, Dr. Kevin Hall, told us to imagine that we are the young Isaiah, a member of a prominent Jewish family, and we are in the temple, maybe even for the funeral service of King Uzziah. The incense is burning and its smoke fills the space. The priests and the choirs are chanting. All around us the congregation is caught up in the ritual. And in that moment, suddenly we have this vision. We imagine that that room we are in has become the throne room of God. We catch glimpses of God on the throne and the seraphim flying about singing. So if we were Isaiah in that moment of worship and ritual, we could also lose ourselves. The awe and the wonder could overtake us. So have you ever experienced that emotion, a feeling of the sublime, of ecstasy, of being caught up in a reality larger than yourselves? I know I have in all sorts of settings. There was the night my father died when I felt the love and compassion of God flooding my very body. There was the time in Rome when I was attending worship at the Vatican and as I took communion, I had something akin to a mystical experience. It has occurred while I was sitting quietly and meditating, while I was in Yosemite National Park lying on a pebbly beach beside a calm lake looking up at the towering granite cliffs above me or walking among the giant sequoias. I experienced it last year when Michael and I watched the rising smoke and fiery glow of the lava pool in the crater of Halima Mama'u on the island of Hawaii. I've also felt that sense of awe and wonder sitting in a hospital room as a pastor watching someone die or in the moment when a baby is born and you get to hold them for the first time. And how about you? Where and how do you experience the holy, the awe-inspiring, the ecstatic? Rudolf Otto was a German scholar writing a century ago, and his major book is entitled The Idea of the Holy, and it has a really catchy subtitle. An inquiry into the non-rational factor in the idea of the divine and its relation to the rational. So I finally read this book in preparation for this series. I had tried reading it once before and didn't get very far. It's very dry reading. So you see, we ministers make these sorts of sacrifices. We read these dense and dry books so that you don't have to. Otto might not be fun to read, but his ideas are basic to understanding this idea of the holy. He claimed that there is a basic non-rational part of the human psyche which is drawn to these moments of awe, that we are wired to experience wonder and mystery. He called it the mysterium tremendum. It's a feeling of dependence, <clears throat> of being a creature, of being not in control. This is the idea of the holy before it ever gets associated with any form of moralism or purification. In primitive humans, it's often associated with a dread or a fear at unknown natural phenomena. It loses some of that anxiety as we advance as a species, but <clears throat> it never completely disappears. Did any of you watch the recent remake of the television show Cosmos, the science series, with Neil deGrasse Tyson? I was fascinated by it on, on many levels. And one thing that was particularly fascinating to me was how religious it was. 
And by religious, I mean this idea of a feeling of dependence in the wake of something grand and overwhelming. Not religious in the institutionalized sense, for Tyson himself is an avowed atheist. The series repeatedly attempted to inspire the viewer's awe at the grandeur and wonder of the universe. It both inspired and humbled at the same time, reminding us that we are but a small thing in the vast stretches of time and space, but that we are also a small thing with a mind that can explore. The idea of the holy was often conveyed with visuals, with incredible pictures and animations from the farthest reaches of space to the tiny depths of the subatomic world. My favorite image from the entire series was watching an animation that predicted <clears throat> what will transpire eons from now when our galaxy collides with our closest neighbor, sending millions of stars into a dazzling cosmic dance. On the whole, the series suggested that science trains us to experience the beauty of the world with awe and rapture. Yet that's a form of religion, as understood by Rudolf Otto, who describes the feeling of personal nothingness and submergence before the awe-inspiring. So let's return to Isaiah 6. Walter Brueggemann, the great scholar of the prophets, writes that Isaiah, here in the presence of God's holiness, has a fresh sense of himself, his inadequacy, his lack of qualification to be in the holy presence. He goes on, there is no coziness here, for God's presence is a source of deep jeopardy. This is a common theme in those who write about the holiness of God, that God is holy other completely separate and distinct from humanity and the physical creation. The holy God is viewed as possibly dangerous, inspiring something akin to that dread that Rudolf Otto found in primitive forms of religion. But Timothy Bradshaw, an Oxford Don who's written a quite wonderful little book on the Lord's Prayer, <clears throat> explores the holiness of God in a different light when he looks at the phrase, hallowed be thy name. The word hallowed, of course, coming from the same root as the word holy. Branshaw writes that the quality of holiness is that God is not common, not to be taken for granted as part of the furniture, as part of, the furniture of life and somehow manipulable. He adds that God is not something we can learn to work. But he also points out that in the Lord's Prayer, the emphasis on God's holiness follows the naming of God as Father. One image is intimate and loving, while the other is more remote and separating. There's an intentional paradox in the opening of the prayer. And for him, the image of God's holiness should not inspire fear, dread, or anxiety. And Bradshaw turns to Isaiah 6 to prove his point. He notices that Isaiah, experiencing his vision of the divine presence, is not left in a state of frozen terror. Yes, Isaiah is filled with awe. Yes, Isaiah repents of his sin and is purified. But it is an energizing and transforming experience because this is the story of Isaiah's call to be a prophet of God, to take God's message to the people. Branshaw writes, this is the renewal of the creature, not its paralysis. He continues that Isaiah emerges from the experience as God's cooperative worker, not as a disgusting vermin full of self-hate. And when I read that, I remembered something that Nikki Zimmerman often says during our discussions in First Forum. In her strict Lutheran upbringing, there was an emphasis upon sinful humanity as being like worms when compared to God. According to Bradshaw, that sort of belittling theology is contrary to God's holiness as revealed in the book of Isaiah. He writes, biblical spirituality 
always upholds creation. Yes, humans have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but God in God's holiness desires not the death of the sinner, but repentance and purposive life. So the rituals and themes of Ash Wednesday and Lent can sometimes put us off because of their focus on confessing sin, repenting, and seeking forgiveness. I know that some people don't like to come on Ash Wednesday and have the ashes marked on their hand or their forehead and be reminded that they're going to die. Although we had a huge crowd this year, and Elizabeth told me right before the service began that uh, Bowen Stephan said to her afterwards, well, of course we all come from dust. We're stardust. But when these rituals of Lent are observed well, these traditions don't belittle us. They don't make us feel like worms. They, are, they instead call us to renewal and transformation, to become our best selves. This is the grace of God, reaching out to us and calling us into a new and deeper relationship, a grace that loves us just the way we are, but also hopes for us to become our best selves. It is this holy and amazing grace which reaches out in Isaiah in the moment in which he feels lost, a holy and amazing grace which brings him healing, forgiveness, and salvation, a holy and amazing grace which sends him forth on a new mission, empowered and renewed. So this Lent, as we encounter the holy God, May we too respond as Isaiah did. Here am I, send me.